My name is Leanne Praza. I'm with Sun Microsystems, and I'm the technical lead and um, lead engineer for Solaris Service Management Facility, and generally systems and service management in Solaris. So the goal today, we've got a small audience, but I wanted to be able to speak for the video record so that um, people could watch this later. And so we might go at a little different pacing, but please feel free to browse through the slides online um, when, when you're looking through. But the goal today is to basically look through Solaris SMF, both current, what we've done in Solaris 10, what's there today with Solaris SMF, as well as what we're looking to do in the future in order to make service management more uh, easier on Solaris and more well integrated. So I first wanted to talk about why the heck did we do this SMF thing? Why did we spend all this time replacing what's essentially a pretty well-known infrastructure of System 5 init scripts and inetd.com? Talk about the basics of SMF, finally go into some service development details, and then talk about the nows, that is to say what, we're, what, what my team's up to and what we're doing today, as well as the future things that we're thinking about. And I'm obviously interested in questions along the way or afterwards. So why did we do this? I mean, what, what is SMF? Why did we actually start thinking about this problem? Well, as we were kind of looking at Solaris over the past few years, we realized that there's a difference between a service and just a mere program running around on the system. It used to be in Unix that you had daemons, and these daemons were important, but they basically had one process. They ran around and did a job, and then when the system rebooted, the daemon went away. Or if the, if the daemon crashed, you got to restart it as an administrator. But things have been getting more sophisticated over the years. Services are no longer just a single process on the system, but they're actually comprised of a whole pile of processes, an application server, your web server, your mail server. None of these things are just a single process anymore. The operating system, on the other hand, all operating systems, traffic in processes. That's their abstraction for dealing with user land things. So we realize that there's this difference between the service and the program, and that you actually want to be able to look at the system and figure out what services are running, not just what processes. Obviously, we want to still maintain that, um, that view into the processes as well, because that's an important debugging and performance analysis tool. The next thing is, because there were no service abstractions, there's actually little support for, um, little OS support for service-based management. You got the init scripts, which you could start and stop, but it was hard to actually figure out what services are running on your system, what services are no longer running on your system before, because they're broken, and what it actually looks like to be a service. The next thing is that parallelism, um, which is more and more important in, in computers today as we get more multi-threaded, more, more multi-core chips, even small systems can take advantage of parallelism. And more programs are being written in order to take advantage of this. But our boot process in Unix actually didn't take advantage of, of this parallelism. So you would basically watch our, your init scripts start one at a time, at a time, at a time. And on a system that had some parallelism, that is to say larger than you know, my laptop of two years ago, that is to say on a modern laptop or most any machine that, most, that, that you'll run Solaris on, parallelism could be exploited during the system boot time. The next thing is that not just managing services was, um, you know, was, was their lack of support for, but we actually didn't know what the services' boundaries were and their relationships with each other. So we could really not do much fault management of these services. We didn't know, for example, that if a single process within SendMail died, does that mean that SendMail is dead? Does that mean that, that, that parts of it are still running? I mean, what, what is the fault boundary of a service? At what point in time? Should the operating system, should the administrator know what to do? This used to all need to be plugged into an administrator's brain. You would have to pgrep for the send mail service, and you would, you, know, you would pgrep for send mail, you would ps eaf grep send mail, whatever your, your invocation was. And you would basically say, ah, send mail. It should have two processes running. There's one that you know, connects, to, there, there, there's one that accepts connections, and there's one that sends the mail out, and there should always be two, and if there aren't two running, there's something wrong. Well, why does that knowledge have to be built into the administrator's brain? Why can't it actually be encoded along with the service? 
we've got a lot of text files, at least um, selfishly as an operating system vendor. We, we actually have a whole lot of different text file con configurations, and each one has their own parser. This, of course, means problems to us in maintaining all these text files because, well, it's a pain to have to write all these parsers. Each one has different bugs. They all look different, and it's generally a pain. But it's also a pain because when you have to look at all these text files, you have to figure out, well, what's the syntax? Are tabs or spaces important? What's the comment character? How do I actually you know, manage these each, each individual operating system service using these text files? And it's actually, you know, it was very difficult to make to, to, to figure out what was going on with the system and furthermore be able to preemptively look for problems in configuration because each individual little subsystem had its own text file. Finally, we figured with all of this, the lack of understanding about the services from the operating system point of view, all the different parsers, that in order to be able to recover from errors, we we're basically we we're missing a ton of opportunities in order to recover from errors on the system automatically, to preemptively notify administrators about errors, and basically just make the system run better. So we wanted to start taking advantage of um, our opportunities to recover from these errors. So what we did in Solaris 10 is we introduced this thing called the service management facility in order to start resolving some of the infrastructure to allow us to do better error recovery, to do better service management. Um, so first of all, we elevated the service to a first class operating system object. We, helped, we, we essentially allow the operating system to understand, and since the operating system can understand, we can write commands around this to say, you know, what is a service? How do we start and stop it? What processes are running in the service right now? Does the administrator want it running or do they not want it, want it running? The ways that you got to do this before is you got to do things like move aside your init script. Well, then you, can't, then, then you get to figure out, well, okay, so if I wanted to re-enable that thing, where do I find the old init script and how do I actually get it running again? Second of all, we developed some consistent configuration and status handling for all services. So we basically looked at the class of services across the operating system and said, what sort of metadata do we need about services? Well, we know, need to know how to start and stop them. We need to know what their name is. We need to know whether they're running or not. We need to know whether the admin wanted them enabled. So some consistent configuration and stand, uh, status handling along with an API to handle all this and store it consistently, persistently across faults. Next, the, we wanted to be able to generally monitor and restart services across vaults. There's a lot of lore and shell scripts and all sorts of sophisticated handling that people have had to do over the years because the operating system didn't help them recover the services from faults. Essentially, your service would crash, you'd have to write some, you know, some, some shell scripts around it, some programs around it to moder monitor whether your important services were running around or not. These were all service specific and you basically had to figure these out on a case by case basis. We wanted the operating system to help, not just to monitor things, but also to be able to restart them when and things failed. After we did all these general things, we said, okay, well, we need to use our stuff. Um, so we converted all of the operating system services, or at least you know, almost all of them. I think we're up to 156 services bundled with Solaris and counting. And the reason we did this was a couple of different things. First of all, we wanted to take advantage of these capabilities that we wrote into the operating system. That was actually really important to us. But second of all, we needed to validate what we'd done, is to say, okay, we need to be able to use this in order to figure out if it's useful enough for other people as well. So we're our own primary consumer, but that's actually a good thing, not just a bad thing. Um, and the last part is, well, Unix has a long and sorted and wonderful history along with a lot of different ex existing mechanisms to solve some of these problems. We have the init.d scripts, which start things during startup and shut things down during shutdown. Init tab's kind of cool because it tries to do some process restarting, but well, you know, it's, it only works if you've got a single process, not if you've got one of these actual complicated services. Um, inetd, our conf is actually, you know, inetd is cool as well because it handles network networking connections a little bit better, but you know, we basically we wanted to be able to have a more sophisticated mechanism which combined all the good parts of those old mechanisms, but still we've got a lot of things, a lot of ISV software that sticks around and uses those old things. So we need to keep those around in order to make sure that all the software that ran on Solaris before still continues to work. 
So that's sort of the overview. Uh, moving into the basics, I wanted to talk about how we plumb this thing together, how it actually works. Um, probably the most important part of SMF is a daemon that we call service.startd. Um, it's taken over most of what init did um, insofar as it takes, it, it starts up system services, it shuts them down and the like. Um, like I said, compatibility for all the old stuff, and it still uses the init tab if you shove something into there. Actually, we start up start D with a init tab today, so um, you know, we, we, we still take advantage of these, uh, of these old pieces of infrastructure. Um, and also, we still run the RC script. So again, things that used to work continue to work in, in, in newer versions of Solaris. Um, what Start D does, in addition to starting up services, is it can automatically restart services. So what we actually looked at is making services a little more intent-based. Is instead of saying, I want to stop the service or I want to start the service, what you actually give is your intent to the system. You say, I want to enable the service. I want to disable the service. I want to enable it temporarily. I want to those sorts of things. What that means is then the operating system can, not, can, can tell the difference between the case where you just went off and killed off the demon, <laughs> and whether that happened to be you killing it off or it core dumped or something else, the operating system didn't used to know whether this was a desired state or not. Now that we have an intent-based command line, we can actually say, based on your intent, your intent is that send mail is enabled. That means the system should try as hard as humanly possible systemly possible, computerly possible, um, in order to, we try as hard as humanly possible to make sure that those things that are enabled stay running. So we start it up at boot, and then we restart it if it dies. So even if you accidentally went off and killed it because, well, kill dash nine isn't actually an intent-based, you know, it isn't actually an intent-based um, um, uh, a command line is basically you could have typed the wrong PID and accidentally killed off the thing that was most critical to your business. Um, the next thing is that we can, you know, again, intent-based command lines, we can disable this, the service with a single command. So we will stop it right away. We'll not start it at boot. And most importantly for us, this is actually a really kind of annoying and subtle thing that used to exist. So when OS is, so, 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 it used to be that the way that you could disable a service would be to remove its link from the RC scripts, right? You would move it aside or remove it. But what happens when you patch your upgrade and the system actually delivers a new version of that RC script? Guess what? It gets enabled again. The only thing that you could do is try to remove the packages and hope that it stays gone or put, you know, put things into your deployment infrastructure or the like. Our goal is to basically, again, now that we know the administrator's intent, the administrator's intent was to disable the service, we actually want to preserve that administrator's intent across patch and upgrade operations as well. Um, so the system actually does some restart of services, and um, uh, the, what I kind of wanted to do is give a picture of how this looks today. I'll talk about INETD in a little bit, and I'll stop thumping on my microphone too. Um, so basically, the way that this looks when we start up the system is we start up the kernel. The kernel knows to start init, and basically the very first thing that init does is starts up service.startd. And then service, and what's important here is these little containers that are, are, are what we call process contracts. This is the cool thing about, as far as I'm concerned, about working on Solaris and open Solaris. When we say, this looks like a user land process, project to me, right? It's like init, start D, FTP, send mail, FMD, okay, all these things are user land processes. But the cool thing, as far as I'm concerned, is we said, well, we need this infrastructure in order to monitor processes on the system. Well, we could do this through some hacky, you know, attach the debugger to the processes, and boo, that's boring. What's actually cool is we can actually put that infrastructure into the kernel and create these things that we call process contracts, which are a grouping of processes that something in user land, in this case start D, can express interest in and say, I care, you know, so, so we create a process contract when we start up a service. Let's say send mail for this case. And send mail starts up two processes, and those are both put into the process contract. And then start D can basically just monitor on the process contract and get events when 
when bad things happen, or even when good things happen, when a new process joins, when a process exits, when all processes on the contract exit, when one of the processes in the contract was um, actually killed by the kernel because we had an unrecoverable memory error in it. We actually can know these things because we have some kernel infrastructure around understanding these process groupings that, that, that a restarter needs to create. I also note, I'll also note here that, um, that, that we have process contracts for init and start D as well. And the reason that we do this is because the kernel monitors init, init monitors start D, and the goal is for our entire system to be restartable from first principles. So um, we actually had an intern work on this last summer, which was pretty fun. We did something we called soft reboots, and it was fairly successful as we could basically just tear down all of user land and bring it back up and without actually restarting the kernel, which, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a fun toy, and the reason why it's a fun toy is when things go wrong in user land, maybe you just want to say, eh, shut it all down, restart it, and, um, and basically, you know, start with the new, new user land bits even though the kernel hasn't changed. So it was kind of a fun little prototype that showed that what we are is, is really resilient to these sorts of failures as far as we can tear down the whole system of the kernel and start it back up again, because we actually have knowledge about what constitutes the system. Finally, the goal is that if there are faults in any part of this, and we test this all the time, if init dies, if start D dies, if config D dies, if inet D dies, if send mail dies, if any of these components fail, we restart them, they pick up their state where they left off and, and basically start running again. So the, um, so, so a, a fun demo that, that I always like to try and I always hope works um, is that, uh, we, we, and we do test this from time to time, is basically you can kill dash nine dash one your system and you can watch most of it come back up. There are a couple of services that are a little less um, friendly to their restart, things like the auto mounter right now, but we're working on those and um, that's basically the goal of a Solaris system is that death of any process can be recovered from. So when we look at the sort of amalgamation of what a service is, the processes that are running, whether, you know, wh whether it started successfully or not, and like, we, we keep a simple set of states for each service. Now this set of states is actually simple and limited for a good reason, and that's because we want to be able to base a lot off, off of this, but it doesn't provide the richness of administrative um, 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 knowledge that we can offer through other interfaces. This is just a simple way of saying, okay, uninitialized, obviously all finite state machines, you need your first state, that's, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> Disabled means it's disabled and not running. We've, we've actually transitioned to disabled. Offline means it's enabled and waiting for dependencies. We'll get to dependencies in a second. Um, online means it's enabled and running. Degraded is, is, is our way of saying that a service is running be below full performance. We don't use this extensively today in Solaris, but we'll be using it more and more in the future. But that's basically to say, eh, it's operational, but it may not be running up to what you've spec'd it at. Yes? Um, so basically, it could go either way. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Good, good, good point. So the question was whether the, you know, whether degraded is something that a human puts some, the service into, or whether the machine can put it into that as well. Is that a correct? Okay. Um, so basically, the answer is both. Uh, so you may want to be able to have a human say. As far as um, the, other, the other point about SMF, the thing we wanted it to be friendly to is systems with mo multiple operators, where it's not just a single operator on the system, but actually multiple operators touching the computer. And so we wanted to be able to have an admin put things into a degraded to say, to mark it as, well, there's something not quite right here, but I don't want to restart it because maybe it's you know Oracle and it takes 30 minutes to start up again or whatever. But I, so I don't want to interrupt that service now, but I want to mark it that way. We've also, we use it in some cases in things like INETD in order to say, you know, well, we're not actually accepting connections as rapidly as we could or the like. Um, and then we expect in future projects to use it more extensively in Start D by having um, some service specific monitoring capabilities so that you could actually do things like actively probe the service to say whether it's running up to spec or not. And obviously that's gonna be service specific. 
The last one is a service is a state that we hope things never go into, but they inevitably do, and that's maintenance. And that's basically a state that is and could that the framework can put a service into, but it will not be left without administrator intervention because maintenance means we've tried as hard as we could to restart this thing and it's not getting better or something failed and we don't know what went wrong or there was some sort of framework error in restarting it and this thing might be in a bad state and we won't, and we need some administrator intervention to get things resolved so while we put well while, while SMF will put things into the maintenance SMF does not take things out of maintenance automatically Um, let's see, service dependencies. So we, we declare, de services can declare dependencies on each other. And so why did we actually do this? Again, hearkening back to the old init script days, the init tab, those sorts of things. Um, basically, we used to start things up in lexicographically sorted order. This is kind of insane if you think about it. It's like, well, it was that thing at S29 because it was supposed to be after when networking started, or was it at S29 because it was supposed to be there after local file systems were mounted? It's like, why, why did we pick that? And there was no actual way of telling. So we really wanted to put tighter dependencies and actually declare what a service depends on. And the other reason that you want to do that is in order to, um, so, so what do we get? We get parallel startup. It just kind of falls out as we can suddenly, we just do some graph sorting and we start things up and um, parallelized. So the other thing that we get out of that is we get an understanding of if something fails, if something that a service depends upon fails, whether we actually, um, whether we actually want to be able to, want to restart the service. So we also have sophistication in our dependencies so we can say whether they're resilient to the failure of the, you know, of the, whether a service is resilient to the failure of the dependency or the like. Um, so that kind of goes into the next point, which is that if we get a hardware error, we can, we can then basically say, well, maybe I don't just need to restart the service, but I need to restart the things that are dependent on it that are actually tightly coupled with the service as well. So that, that is to say, if a memory error that happened that, we could, that the kernel couldn't recover from because essentially we got an eCache parity error, um, that we, we um, or, or an uncorrectable error rather than just an eCache parity error by UE, um, then we can basically say, well, anything which is tightly coupled with this service probably needs to be restarted too because, you know, it's got a bunch of shared memory segments, you know, it, it, they basically are too intertwined and we should restart them all together. And then finally, um, because of dependencies, we, we, a service kind of hangs out in the offline state until its dependencies are satisfied. And, and that's kind of can be a little annoying and confusing the first time because it's like, I told this service to start, why won't it start? And the answer is, well, because its dependencies aren't satisfied yet. And the service author, you know, which could have been you or could have been somebody at Sun or could have been somebody at Blastwave or whatever, said, mm, this service shouldn't start until all of its dependencies are satisfied. So a new command, services-x, allows us to answer questions about about, well, what's going on? What's this service waiting for? This is an eye chart at best. Um, but basically, when we did, uh, I don't remember how current this is, it's probably six months old or something. Um, there's been some new services added since. But this is what our dependency graph looks like on the Solaris that we ship. It's actually incredibly complex, but was really easy to generate by basically just saying, oh, okay, so somewhere down here is, you know, I, I require the loop back to be mounted, and then, you know, I, I, then I can mount some file systems, and because I net booted, I have, and then eventually I can start up things like, uh, usually file system local is somewhere in here. It's a pretty strongly connected node, you know, and then eventually we get to inetd, and, you know, somewhere back here is the login and the like. But we can generate this without, ha with, without a human having to kind of look at the whole complexity from the start. Because a human can drill down and say, oh, I actually care about this service here and I can look at he who he depends on and who depends upon him. Oh, and we have uh, on opensolaris.org, so basically when I talk about SMF and Solaris, I'm actually talking about SMF and open Solaris because 
we do all of our work in the open. We have a community on opensolaris.org where we're asking, where, 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 we, um, where, where we answer questions and kind of um, take contributions and all that. And the program which generated this is called SCF. And it's actually sitting on opensolaris.org if you want to generate one for your own system too. Um, Here's where I'm gonna start going a little bit faster because I have too many slides for my time. And um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna skip through a bunch of this. The slides should be available online. I'll probably also post them on my blog or something, but um, so, that, uh, so, so that you can kind of go through the details later. But um, we want, methods are the other way we can actually, that, you know, so I talked about how an admin communicates with a service. Method is a way that the that, that SMF communicates with the service itself. So basically, um, we use methods to manipulate a service. They can be scripts, they can be binaries, they can actually be automatic actions as well that we've coded into the framework. Um, so you can either keep your old init scripts around, and the goal is that you can basically just reuse an init script as a method, um, or you can actually, uh, um, you know, or, or, or you can just invoke binaries directly and get rid of the middleman, get rid of that init script along the way. Because we, oh yeah, and you can use things like, you know, use Perl, use Python, use, you know, your favorite shell interpreter or whatever. So no longer do we have some of the restrictions that we used to have through init.d scripts. Um, the next reason, you know, the, one of the other reasons that we did SMF and the actual, one, of the, one of the cool things that a service object on the system gives us is it actually gives us a, a handle with which to manage the service. So we can, we can start talking about things that we've put into Solaris. Okay, simple things that we didn't put into Solaris like users and groups. What user does this service run as? You no longer have to, you know, you, you no longer have to essentially exec the service. Um, you, can, you can put it as meta configuration. Um, furthermore, other things that we put into Solaris like privileges. So basically in Solaris 10 we also put in something called least privileges. Least privileges, I, I love least privileges, they're pretty cool. They allow you to basically give fine-grained privileges to an application as you can basically say, well I want this, I want this application to run not as root, but I want to give him the privileges to bind to reserved ports, right? But he shouldn't have any other any other elevated privileges. Other than that, he should be a normal user. Um, so you can do the same thing like, or you could say, I've got this hyper-privileged daemon, but in order to avoid buffer overflow attacks, how do you usually exploit a buffer overflow attack? You do so by basically getting it to exec something else, right? So you make it, you say a service can run as super user, you know, with all the privileges that he needs, but take away the exec privilege. Least privileges in general, they used to, you used to have to modify the, the binary itself in order to take advantage of this. But with SMF, we have a service handle and we can actually have our restarters exec the, um, exec the services with the new privilege set that you specified. And then resource management, actually, the SMF team came out of the resource management team in Solaris. And one of the reasons why is because it was actually kind of hard to say, oh, I want my NFS server to be running in this project with these sorts of, you know, with, with these sorts of resource controls on it. You can actually now tie things together much more closely and say mm, the NFS server should run as, you know, the NFS server project and, and we want to give it, you know, a CPU cap of a certain amount because NFS isn't important on the system. Um, let's see, configuration, we, like I said, we want to unify configuration, and when I say configuration, we want to unify both configuration and service status reporting. Those were both important to us. So um, we store all of this in something called config D, or the repository. Um, Underneath the covers, it's a little SQLite database, but basically it, that's, that's fairly implementation specific. We could change that out at some point in time. SQLite just happened to you know, fill our requirements for what we needed from a repository. And it's all, all access goes through this daemon called config.d, and that's also important because that's where we do all of our privilege management and we do our authentication and all of those pieces. So we have this you know, daemon which, which mitigates access to the repository. 
we both have, um, so when I talk about services, I'm kind of using this convenient shorthand. We actually went and we implemented a, a, a two-level scheme with both services and instances. And the reason that we did this is because we wanted to do some, some amount of configura configuration sharing amongst like implementations of the same thing. So if you have your web server, you, we wanted to be able to say, share all this configuration amongst my web servers, except for the, you know, except for the port that it runs on and its home directory. And, and its home directory. Okay, fine. But we, you shouldn't have to duplicate that configuration across all of them, especially as you change defaults. So that's so both services can have properties and instances can have properties, and it's a pretty simple composition that if you, you look up a property on an instance, you, we first look on the instance. If it exists there, we, 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 say, we, we basically give you back that property on the instance. If it doesn't exist there, we'll go look it up on the service. Um, FMRIs are our names for services. Um, basically, we have a namespace that we share with the FMA team, and we're expanding this namespace um, with, 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 different things over, with, with different things over time. But SVC is the namespace that we've carved out for our services. Um, they have a big, long name, including a category, um, you know, syst uh, like system. System cron is the service name, and the thing after the colon is the instance name. So you could have default, and it doesn't make much sense with cron to have multiple crons running around, but you know you could. Um, let's see. The other thing is that our commands all accept abbreviations and globbing. While this fMRI is the formal name, it's the unique name on the system, um, you don't have to actually type this big, ugly thing in for all of our admin commands, because who the heck would want to? Um, so you can do things like for this example, you can, you can use all our commands with cron. Um, we've split things up in the repository into both properties as well as property groups. Um, property groups are basically just a grouping for properties. Properties have a well-defined uh, set of types that they can take on, and these are things like strings and a str you know, so, and a strings and binary globs and integers and you know the the stand booleans, the standard stuff. Property groups are groupings for properties, so it's not an entirely flat namespace. And the really nice thing is you can define your own types on property groups, and we kind of use this extensively in order to so that you can do things like make searching easier um, for your if you have an application putting configuration into the repository. We take snapshots. I won't go into the details here, but snapshots are basically a way so that we can actually roll back to previous configurations as well as we can do transactional updates to services themselves. So you can basically, with the service atom refresh command, say, I want to take all these you know, configurations that I've been working on for a while and commit it to the running snapshot, which is where we read all the properties from. Um, we've got a library. The library's okay. Um, we're, we're adding some more simple interfaces to that over time, as well as there is a truly simple to use command called service prop, which has committed output and we're not going to change it over time and all that, um, so that you can actually look at configuration in the repository, grab it from shelf scripts or whatever. Um, and we're using these more and more extensively lately. Um, one of the one of the things that's come in since early Solaris 10 is something called secure by default. Um, secure by default is, it was about time for us to ship Solaris with all insecure remote protocols turned off. Turn off Telnet by default. Um, turn, turn off, you know, basically RPC binds remote connections by default, all of those sorts of things. This actually all uses SMF today. Um, so we, we, so SPD is implemented by something we call an SMF profile, profile, which enables and disables all the appropriate services to put you into secure by default mode, as well as Twiddle's properties, like <laughs> RPC bind has a um, config slash local only property, which says whether it should accept connections from the, you know, the, the, the big bad outside network, or whether it should only accept them internally. Um, all users, today, all users can read all repository properties, but we had a request for um, some secret data to be able to be stored in the repository, and so we're adding capabilities for sort of um, um, private or secret repository data in the future. Um, that's mentioned on SMF Discuss and, and, and was talked about pretty extensively there. Um, finally, 
the way that we do, um, one of the things we wanted to do with SMF is allow delegated administration so that you could essentially have, um, you could give away in your operation, say, I want to be root, but I've got, you know, I've got a web server admin, I've got an Oracle admin, I've got, you know, I've, I've, I've got a send mail admin. They should be able to, you know, reconfigure, start and stop, all of those things, play with their service. But, you know, so how do we do that? We actually give this, um, give, we, we, we allow you to delegate right privileges um, to the repository. And because all of our communication happens through the repository, uh, we, we basically, it, it, it's all done through that point of control rather than having us, uh, requiring us to put a bunch of, you know, checking, authorization checking into each individual command. Uh, manifests are a delivery system uh, that it's a, basically a bunch of XML goo which describes the service to the system. Um, I must have actually removed the, the, the hmm, funny. Okay, uh, they're relatively short and basically are fairly simple to create, usually by copying an existing one um, because who wants to write XML from scratch? I don't. Um, so basically, uh, the, you deliver a manifest in order to describe your service to the system. Okay, um, we have a bunch of commands. I'm not gonna go through all the details of these, but basically services is the status querying. It's like, give me information about the system. Dash X is pretty cool. It'll tell you what's wrong with the system. Uh, basically, if it's service is in an unusual state, it will tell you about it. The service is enabled, but it's offline, and then it'll start trying to tell you why it's offline or why it's in maintenance. Um, service atom is how you actually administer the service. Um, common actions that you have for the service, enable, disable. You can restart the service, um, refresh I talked about a little bit, um, and then clear is how you say that the service has been basically, it was in maintenance, I've repaired it, time to try, try to restart again. Service config is our um, Swiss Army tool for the uh, Swiss Army tool for the repository. It basically gives you pretty raw and unfettered access to the repository. Um, a nice thing is, you know, you, we we actually have a couple of different access patterns. Um, it's also kind of an interactive shell and can be used in shell scripting as well. And then service prop is just a you know attempt to be a simpler way of just getting property information. So if you want to query the repository from your scripts, service prop is a much simpler way of doing it usually than service config because it's just meant to be you know, a query or it doesn't have an extended um, syntax to try to do a whole bunch. So you can basically just say things like service prop dash p property, right? Get the enabled property out of Apache 2. Um, so I've talked a lot about service.startd, which is sort of our master, it's the master graph engine and our master restarter. So basically it, it manages all the service dependencies across the system, as well as restarts things that used to be started by init. But not everything fits into startd's model. I mean, a clear example is inetd. Inetd does some plumbing for the service, it sets up the port and all that, it handles incoming connections before the service is, um, is actually started. So what we also wanted to do is we kind of split start D in half. As we said, well, this half is the graph engine. It handles states, it handles dependencies, it handles all of those things. The other half is a restarter. And a restarter basically takes care of doing exactly what you might expect. It starts, stops, does all those sorts of things for the services. So we allow other things to be delegated restarters as well. Um, and right now we have inetd as our bundled restarter, but in the future we expect to have more. So service development, I'm, uh, I, again, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna cruise through most of these slides because I don't need to go into the detail now, but, um, I did want to go through the benefits, is why, does, why, why would you actually want to integrate your stuff with SMF? So first of all, the services go ahead and they appear with SMF fMRIs. You, know, you, can, you can use the Solaris tools to see them, enable them, disable them. Um, and then the other thing is we're developing a suite of tools on top of SMF and they just basically look at the repository. They look at existing services on the system. So if your service appears there, then our tools will manage it, no extra work from you. Um, 
Next is the built-in restart so that you don't actually have to go off and implement your own monitoring and own restart of all the services. Um, so, and then also it participates in, in, in handling for our software faults, and that's kind of important. So in Solaris, we've also introduced a, a partner technology to SMF that we call the fault management architecture. And the fault management architecture, its job is to basically be both reactive and proactive about hardware faults on the system. So first it can react to spurious and known hardware faults. So if a CPU just fails, if we, if we get an uncorrectable memory error back from the CPU's cache or from a piece of memory, those sorts of things, we can, it actually reacts to those things by taking the CPU offline, or in the case of a UE, killing the process that had the uncorrectable memory error in it. If you use SMF, the process is killed because of uncorrectable memory error, SMF will restart it again. That's basically all integrated. If you don't use SMF, if you're starting up with an RC script or whatever, we basically say, we don't know how your processes relate to other processes on the system, so we have to basically kill it and leave it dead. Um, and then Finally, we're, we're, we are working on, or we're looking to work on future software, more, more software diagnosis capabilities. And now that we've got all these cool things with knowing about when a, you know, knowing that a service dies and be able to recover from it, we can actually start doing some interesting metrics around this and say, huh, your service is always dying at, you know, your peak hour of Tuesday at 7 p.m. We started, we restarted it for you. you know, your service wasn't interrupted for your customers, but maybe you want to tell your developers that this service always dies when the load is at this amount or the like. Um, we wanted service development to be really incremental. Um, a manifest is usually all that's required and is, doesn't take too terribly much to get working. Um, like I said, we created about 150 of these in Solaris with a team of about three engineers, so it's, it's not that hard. Um, and you certainly, once you've learned your first one, they're, they're pretty easy from there on out. Um, you can actually then get more involved. You can handle error cases much more you know, gracefully. You can say things like, I know this error is a configuration error. You can tell SMF you exited due to a configuration error. Then SMF can tell the admin it exited due to a configuration error. Um, things like full restartability so that you can say, oh, these are components of my service. They can fail separately, put them into different services. And then, um, you know, finally, you can kind of go whole hog and say, well, some of these processes in my service, they're worker processes. I know more about them than SMF could possibly. So I can indicate to SMF, eh, they're worker processes. You don't need to re restart the service if these guys can, if, if these guys cord up all the time, for example. We saw this a lot with send mail. Um, people like to have proc mail and the filters and the like, which cord up all the time. So we basically get to tell the service, eh, well, so that maybe that's not so important to you. You don't need to restart just because something core dumped in, you know, in a proc mail script. Um, I'm going to skip over these pieces, but this is basically what a manifest looks like. Like I said, it's a wad of XML goo, but it's not, you know, it's not terribly complex. You've got, you know, do I want a default instance? Do I want that instance enabled? Um, or can there be more than one instance of this service running at a time? What are my dependencies? I'm UTEP, so I actually rely on the system being configured for the first time before I run. Um, what depends on me, multi-user, I want to start UTEMP as part of, you know, RC2. And then finally, okay, so I've got dependencies, I've got what depends on me, and then finally I get to say, okay, my methods, how do you start, right, and, and how do I stop? And the cool thing here is we didn't have to write a special stop script, we basically can say, eh, kill everything in that contract. And like we talked about before, because we know what processes are all part of that service, we can just go ahead and kill them off for you, and you don't have to worry about tracking what the name was so you could p-kill it and then you know, getting it wrong and having it p-kill some other service. The last stuff is basically gravy. Um, it's basically so that we can give a common name that's localized about the service itself, as well as references to the man pages or any other external documentation that might be useful to somebody who is debugging a problem with that daemon. 
There are some things you can do, like I said, to be, to be more, more friendly to SMF and more friendly to people looking at, at failures of your service. Um, so you can say things like it's a configuration error in the service or it's a fatal error. Don't bother to restart me because I'm not going to get any better. And many services actually know that um, when they're starting up that things, that some errors are fatal. Um, let's see, we've got a DTD for the manifest. Um, it's actually fairly well documented on its own. Um, it's got lots of comments and the like. And then the other thing is, like I said, it's been a long time since I wrote a service from scratch. Basically, I tend to take one of these examples and go ahead and start from it and just modify. And there are usually about four things to modify and you're done. Um, you temp for a standalone daemon. Core Atom for something that blats a bunch of configuration in the kernel but never has to run again, and then Telnet for an INET demanaged daemon. Um, Services-X, I think I should repeat that a few more times. Services-X, Services-X. Um, so basically, Services-X is how we want to explore errors on the system and to be able to say, here's what's, you know, this sort of global view of what might be wrong with your system. So that's, that's where we're starting um, and that's where we're adding to as we diagnose more and more failures on the system. Um, let's see. We try to log for our services. That's actually pretty important to us is it used to be that what would happen is people would just dump their, their init script output to the console. And this was great if you had a console logger and something went wrong, but terrible if you didn't have a console logger and something went wrong. So um, we actually save all of those sort of things that scripts like to send to standard out and standard air, along with, you know, a log of what SMF is trying to do. Oh, I decided to, you know, you told me to enable this service, so I enabled it. You told me to disable it. Some, you know, a dependency failed, so I had to restart it. Those sorts of things um, we put into the log. Um, we also have things like you can set environment variables in the service, and we're looking actually to increase the debugging capabilities in the future. And we've been having that discussion on SMF Discuss. And um, please give me feedback on debugging capabilities you might want added. Or come join us on SMF Discuss at opensolaris.org and um, talk to us about it. Because we're, we're actually, we, we know that we could be providing more to people who have to basically put a daemon into debugging mode and sort of up-level that in the same way that we've up-leveled service administration in general. So that you could basically say, well, I want to make sure that this daemon you know, logs everything it's doing, and then SMF can tell me about where it's putting the log file and everything. Um, Services-X. Uh, <laughs> So I can say it again. But basically, we try to give as much information as possible in the services dash X pointer about how to recover. And you can revert to a previous snapshot if you've been mucking with the configuration a lot. Um, and we'll make that easier in the future. But it's, it, 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 it's kind of a nice safety blanket. Um, I'm going to skip over packaging. There are references to. Um, yeah, and I probably should have referred to the Open Solaris site. I'll refer to it. I'll have a link to the Open Solaris site at the end. But lots of developers are coming to Open Solaris and talking to us about problems they're having. And the important thing is it's not just a matter of, well, yes, we answer the question immediately. But that feedback is what we're using to design the next, um, the next things in SMF. So let me talk about, finally, um, and I'm going to end close to on time, even though we started a little bit late. But I want to talk about what we're doing now, what, what basically what the SMF team is, is busy coding um, today, as well as sort of where we want to go in the future. So the current things that we were looking at is we spent a lot of time initially with SMF trying to make things easy for the administrator, OK? Make it really easy to do the common things, enable, disable, restart, those sorts of things. We put configuration, we put this meta configuration into SMF, but as more and more stuff is actually using the configuration um, capabilities, we realize that there are probably some gaps. 
first of all, repeatable customization was one. We actually wanted to, wanted to make it really just truly simple to pick up your customizations, not things that the system necessarily, well, that too. But let's start with the things that are your customizations. The system shipped to you with a set of defaults. And then you went off and customized. You basically said, well, OK, but I don't want SendMail running on this server um, for, for NFS. I want to run you know, more threads on this server, those sorts of things. What are my customizations on the system? So we wanted uh, what was really important to us is a way to extract First of all, to know what, the what, what an administrator has customized, extract that information, and then repeat it on another system so that it's really easy to deploy things. Along with that is the ability to basically pick up the entire configuration of a system and go redeploy it. But the differences are actually really interesting to be able to say, what have I configured on the system? Um, we wanted to do more configuration validation during input. I mean, we've got some simple typing capabilities, so we can start by saying, are you inputting thing of the right type? Uh, but we also wanted to do a little bit, um, a little bit more individual uh, validation. Let's see, auditing as well. Um, we've basically got the code done and just have to finish putting it back. But, but we can do auditing for all administrative events with an SMF, as well as configuration changes. And the security team's really excited about this because it used to be that when you did auditing of a file change, a configuration file change, all our audit trail could tell you is the file changed. Hmm. What to do? The file changed. What was the old version? What was the new version? Who the heck knows? But now in the audit payload, actually, we can um, we can put together and the information of you've added this property, you deleted this property, you changed this property, its old value was this, its new value is this, and actually say something really interesting about what's going on on your system over time. We're using VSM auditing, which is our basic security module auditing, because, well, it's the audit trail we have in the system. It's secure, all of those things. So that's why we're using it today. Um, and I'm hoping that as soon as we have it out, that'll have a little bit of time, because I'm excited about actually creating something that, that kind of shows you what's going on in your system over time. And it should be really easy to do with this. Um, our manifest imports performance on first boot is um, a little marginal, so we're looking to improve that. Um, we actually have some ideas on how to do that. And at the same point in time, um, simplifying delivery of early boot services, services that actually need to start before the root file system is mounted read-write. Things are pretty cool for application services because you know they start relatively late in the boot process and just kind of, you know, they, they, they don't need to do anything special. But it actually turns out that in the operating system, because we're the framework that plums up the rest of the infrastructure, we're the ones who mount root read write, we're the ones who mount all the other file systems, that we actually you know, need it to be a little bit easier than it is today to deliver early boot services. Um, finally, we're doing some unification around our interfaces for service administration. Um, Solaris doesn't have a ton of GUIs today, but we realized that with SMF, we have a lot of metadata about, you know, about services on the system. And we can do some generation of GUIs a lot simpler than it would be to write GUIs individually for each individual piece. We're doing that part too, but we're actually pretty excited about the idea that you can um, that, that you can kind of just look at the services on the system and give a relatively pretty view of what are, what's their status and you know, what can you configure on the service with a little bit of metadata about it. So what sort of projects are we working on? All of these are open on Open Solaris. We take comments quite happily. Um, so the um, Enhanced Profiles project is, sounds small, but is actually um, much bigger in implementation than it sounds like. So the general goal is to be able to customize and easily deploy configuration like I was just talking about. So you can essentially um, you know, take, take this wad of configuration you want to apply to a new system and you know, generate it pretty simply and then just go throw it at machines, as, as, as many machines as you want. So. Um, what we realized is we sort of had these profiles in, in SMF today, but 
they were relatively simple and they had no representation in the repository itself. So it was hard for us to tell where configuration came from. Did it come from, you know, did it come from the, the, the original service author? Did it come from, like I was just talking about, the secure by default? Did it come from the secure by default team saying, or the admin saying, I want this system to be, you know, open to the world or closed to the world? Um, and then the, the last thing is um, we wanted to be able to make it easy to drop this profile into place during system deployment. Hmm? Okay, so, um, so there's another talk starting, so I'm gonna have to, to, to close this one up. But um, you know, we, we, we do have a couple, I'll, I'll put these slides up and um, you know, we've, we've got a couple of other things going on, sort of just a, a view of, sort of the system administration stuff that we're doing. And then, you know, futures are to work on our fault model in more detail, um, come up with a public restarter API, as well as um, do some more configuration sharing and deployment across the system. So I'm going to entertain questions probably off to the side um, in, in a bit so, so that the next talk can come online. But um, thanks to everybody for watching. Um, you can always reach me directly, Leanne Praza at sun.com, or um, I'm active as well as the rest of the SMF team is incredibly active on our community on Open Solaris. So thank you. Yeah.